Hello, I'm Alexia. Let me help you to take the fear out of birth with a mix of real-life positive birth stories and birthing experts sharing their wisdom. I'll also be sharing tips to help you get into the fearless mindset. Fear Free Childbirth is the online destination for women seeking to take the fear out of birth with fear clearance meditations, online fear clearance courses and programmes for overcoming tocophobia. Find out more at fearfreechildbirth.com. Hello and welcome back to the Fear Free Childbirth podcast. This is me, your host, Alexia Leachman. Thank you so much for joining me. Can you tell how excited I am today? Well, the reason for that is because today's episode has got to be my most favourite episode ever. And the reason for that is because I'm interviewing one of my heroes, um, this today's episode I'm chatting to Thomas Verney. Now he is probably like the father of prenatal psychology. He is the author of the book The Secret of the Unborn Child and his work was just so instrumental in shaping a lot of my thinking and it's fascinating, fascinating work and so today I get to ask him all of my burning questions that I think you're going to love to hear the answer to. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what you can expect from my chat with Thomas in a bit, but I have got some other things I just want to share with you before that. Now, um, for the birth professionals among you, I am getting, I just wanted to give you a little bit of an update because I'm getting quite a lot of emails on this at the moment. Um, So yes, I am training birth professionals in the fear clearance method in fearless birthing. And so for those of you that are interested in being trained in the fear clearance method, maybe you're a doula, maybe you're a midwife, or a uh, maybe you work with uh, women preparing for pregnancy in, on their fertility journey, or maybe um, you're a yoga teacher and a lot of women come to you and share with you their angst and their fears and you want to be able to support them in ways that you can't right now, then this is what the training can help you with. So if you are interested, then you can head over to the Fearless Birthing website. Yay, it's a new website that basically has got all my fearless birthing stuff on it. So it's fearless-birthing.com and you can look into the professional training there. We're going to have the next round of training opening up in the next couple of months. So um, feel free to go out and check that out. So that's the first thing I wanted to share with you. And the other thing was for the ladies that might think that they have tocophobia. I've got my next group program coming up during February as well. So this is for you if you want to overcome tocophobia as part of a group and, you know, we'll get together, have a call once a week. You go through clearing your fears and we all come together and um, share in aha moments and um, successes and all that stuff as you battle your fears and overcome them with success. So that's happening in February. So if you want to join me for that, then you can um, get in touch with me at the fearfreechildbirth.com website. You can go to uh, forward slash tocophobia support program.com to sign up um, and all that good stuff. So yeah, two really good things that are happening in the next couple of months that I wanted to share with you. Now, back to today's episode. So yeah, I am so excited about this episode. This episode with Thomas Verney is just fantastic. There's something for everyone here, whether you are planning your pregnancy, whether you're on the fertility journey and wondering, you know, things are not going easy for you, whether you are pregnant, where, you know, wherever you are on the journey, this there's something here for you. We talk about, um, we talk about the, the role, you know, how your different emotions that you experience day to day during pregnancy, how that does affect the baby. You know, I get a lot of emails from women saying, oh, you know, I, I feel so guilty because when, you know, I have these, I, I feel like this and then I feel like this and I'm just worried about the impact that that has on my baby. Well, listen to this episode because Thomas will be sharing all about that. Talks about how to connect with your baby. Um, talks about, we talk about tocophobia and the root of tocophobia, what some of the reasons might be that you have tocophobia. So if you have tocophobia, then this will be super fascinating for you too. What I found personally fascinating as well is how the the birth outcome, that like the type of birth that you have and how that plays into the kind of personality and quirks that you have. So we talk about C-section, what kind of person you might be as a result of having a C-section, breech baby, vaginal birth, forceps, super, super fascinating. And and why, therefore, it's important to strive to have an unassisted vaginal birth from a psychological perspective for your child. I mean, there is so much in this episode. It really is absolutely fascinating. So I'm just going to stop wittering on and just hand over to the time that I spoke to Thomas Verney, my hero. So my name is Thomas Verney. I am a psychiatrist uh, living in Stratford, Ontario, Canada. 
And I've written quite a number of books on pregnancy, the psychology of pregnancy, and also in 1982, uh, I started the Pre and Perinatal Psychology Association of North America, which is doing extremely well even after all these years. That's me in a nutshell. Brilliant. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm so excited about having this conversation with you. There is so much I want to ask you. But first of all, I think the place I'd like to start is the birth experience. So the one of the main reasons why I really, you know, put my energy into this podcast is because I really want women to do everything they can to prepare for a positive birth experience. And that is because for her, it's important to have a birth experience that I think she can remember with fondly and have positive emotions and feelings towards. But I also think it's a really important thing for the baby as well. So I'd love it if we could start talking about the actual birth experience and and what um, babies pick up on, um, how that might impact on them, you know, so that why we should really work towards that birth experience. Right. Yeah. Before we get actually to the birth experience, if I could just interject that in order to have a, uh, a healthy pregnancy and a healthy birth, it's very important to sort of focus on about five major psychological factors. And the first one is a desire for a child. Mm. Like if the pregnant mother really, really wants to have a baby, okay, is totally focused on it so that we are eliminating any kinds of uh, ambivalent feelings, you know, uh, is this a good time to have a baby? Do I have the finances? All those kinds of things. If we can get rid of those and have like a clear idea that this is the baby that I really want to have, that is incredibly important in terms of, you know, not exactly guaranteeing, but certainly preparing uh, the best possible uh, kind of pregnancy and, 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 pregnancy outcome. And the second most important factor, interestingly enough, and we have research on this from every corner of the world, is the pregnant woman's relationship to her partner. Mm. If if she has a good relationship, if he is supportive, if he's there with her all the time, he attends um, he, he attends prenatal classes, he's supportive, uh, doesn't make uh, any neurotic demands on her time and presence, all that kind of stuff, that is the second most important thing. And of course, you know, the partner can be a man or a woman, it doesn't really matter, but uh, whoever the partner is has to be there and be supportive. Mm. The third most important thing is relationship to one's own mother. That's really, really interesting. Mm. Um, Because you see, and you may speak on this from your own experience, if you like. Um, But if you have had a mother who was very negative about you, okay, who was very critical, uh, who said things like, oh, you're too fat, you're too skinny. Um, Oh, you never, you can never do anything right. You will be lucky if you ever get married, you know, that kind of negativity. And there are women like that, unfortunately. then even though that person may grow up perfectly fine for all intents and purposes, when a woman becomes pregnant, she becomes much more vulnerable to anxieties. It, it mm. goes with the territory, okay? Because pregnancy, I mean, especially the first pregnancy, you are on a journey that you have never traveled on before, right? This is an unknown path. And so not knowing where you're going is always fear inducing. Mm. So during pregnancy, you know, a woman is much more vulnerable to anxieties. And so these old, uh, you know, tapes from mother and father to some extent, but mother is more powerful. These old tapes start playing in your head. And the woman, you know, the woman will ask herself, you know, uh, gee, perhaps my mother was right, you know, perhaps I'm not as competent as I have thought I was, you know, what, what, if, what, what if I have a miscarriage, you know, all these kinds of things start coming up. So I think that if you do, if you do carry, you know, that kind of, um, of, of luggage with you, uh, it would be a really good idea to speak to someone, you know, some about it, some, some mental health 
counselor or a doula or a midwife or whoever you trust, even your partner. Mm. Yeah, so I think those three. Uh, and the fourth one, you know, is your own birth. Mm. Because if, let's say, a cesarean section, it is only natural for you to start to think that, well, I was a C-section, I would probably give birth also through C-section. So, or, or if you have had a very difficult birth, a very complicated birth, um, if you were separated from your mother and perhaps were in an incubator for four weeks, anything like that, all those things really need to be looked at if you want to have as a uh, risk-free and healthy and easy birth. So in terms of the birth experience, yeah. um, what my, my take on that is that the birth experience that a baby experiences is very different from that which the mother experiences. That's right. And so it's very difficult. You know, and I encourage the women I work with to sort of explore their birth and they go, oh, my birth was fine. And I said, <laughs> yes. well, maybe that's what your mother said. Maybe it wasn't a, a big deal for her. But think about it from the baby's perspective and how you might have felt coming into the world so you're nodding so what what would you like can you say something around that for my listeners yeah. so they can better well, understand I'll, I'll, I'll just tell you a tiny bit of an anecdote um uh, you know when i wrote this book when i wrote my first book on pregnancy the secret life of the unborn child which i think you have there yes i do if, uh when i wrote the secret life of the unborn child after it got published i gave it to my mother my mother uh read it and then uh, then when I visited her the next time, she said to me, uh, you don't really remember your birth, do you? <laughs> and, you know, there was a tinge of guilt in that. Like if I did remember it, it would probably be some kind of a negative memory and I better not remember it, right? <laughs> so, you know, mothers are concerned and, and, you know, it's totally understandable. Mothers are concerned that they have done something wrong and that they have hurt their children mm -hmm. and you know I, I always work on the assumption that every parent does the absolute best they can uh, with what they have you know with the tools that they have and uh, certainly uh, perhaps less so in your mother's time but certainly in my mother's time you know there were not very many tools uh, people did not read books like The Secret Life of the Unborn Child. There were no such books around. Uh, nobody even ever talked much about pregnancy because it was kind of a taboo subject because, after all, it has to do with sex in some ways, right? So mm. we better not talk about that. Yeah, so what was your question? <laughs> well, I was just curious as to, you know, whether there is, you know, the, the actual experience of the child because going back to the question I started with, you know, the, the reason why I think it's so important to work to protect the birth experience is because the impact that the birth experience will have on the baby you know how they experience that and how that manifests in their life later right so most people don't realize you know that life as we know it does not begin at birth that that unborn child already has a mental life before birth and they simply, no doubt about it, really, I mean, the research is absolutely solid on this, that from the end of the second trimester, in other words, by six months after conception, the unborn child is a sensing, feeling, and uh, sensible, and, and, and remembering, to some extent, human being, okay? This is not a little goldfish swimming around in a little bowl of water, okay? This is a tiny, tiny little human being. And so if that is the case, and as I say, it is, uh, then we really need to deal with the child at birth in a different way because that child can remember forever, although what he or she remembers may not be accessible to consciousness, but nonetheless, you know, if... Uh, if a doctor says, oh, my, I don't think this child is going to survive, let's say, or makes or, oh, my God, look at his nose. Gee, isn't that just awful? <laughs> um, you know, comments like that can sting you and stay with you a lifetime. And mm -hmm. so, you know, that child has to be treated with respect that human life deserves. 
and 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 also must not be separated from the mother if at all possible you know like rooming in is terribly important and putting the child on the mother's breast right after the child is born is also very very important so that both of them can start connecting with each other which of course is called bonding and attachment so those first few hours and then following up the first few months uh, lay down you know uh, lay down the the personality of that child for for the rest of his or her life it's incredibly important so um what can the mother do then while i mean you're saying that the baby is is essentially the, the human being starting you know from 6 months pregnant so what can a mother do then during her pregnancy to nurture to encourage the baby to thrive i mean the the term that i've come across is prenatal enrichment um so you know connecting to baby talking to baby i'm thinking you know what what things that that could you suggest that that women can do to start really kind of building that and taking that on board and, and really nurturing the baby okay so you know everything in moderation certainly applies here too because you know what like when my my book first came out you know i got a lot of calls from from engineers and other people who wanted to um create some kind of a boom box or whatever uh, that they would put on the mother's abdomen and play Mozart to the unborn child because in my book I said how important classical music is for the development, for the maximal development of the brain of the unborn child. But the important thing to remember is that that child is sleeping about 90% of the time, okay? And to interrupt that sleep is totally counterproductive because that child, in order to grow properly and to integrate, you know, all the senses, needs that sleep. So only do everything that you and I will speak about in the next few minutes, only do it when you know that your child is awake Mm -hmm. because you don't want to interrupt his or her sleep. Okay, so the kinds of things that you can do, you have already mentioned, speak to the baby. I think, I think singing to the baby is great. Um, I will come back to that in a second. Uh, dancing with the baby can be good. Uh, women have told me that uh, during the last trimester, when they push sort of with one hand into the uterus, or, sorry, with a couple of fingers into the uterus on one side, then they shift to the other side, do that a few times, the baby picks up the game and starts pushing against their Mm -hmm. fingers. And mothers have told me that this is just the most incredible experience, you know, like suddenly they are actually connecting with their unborn child. It's fantastic. It's fantastic. So uh, I'm in favor of doing natural things, you know, don't put any apparatus on your abdomen Uh, listening to music that you like is important, but do not listen to rock, do not listen to, you know, anything that is incredibly loud, Mm. okay, Mm -hmm. because that upsets babies. Mm. And I want to tell you another another little anecdote. Uh, I was being interviewed by a woman in California the other day, and we were talking about these things, and she said, well, you know, when I was pregnant the first time, um, my husband was an intern and he was never home studying to be a doctor. Uh, and then uh, three years later, when I had my second child, he was already finished. And so every night he would talk to my baby. And I said, well, what would he, what would he say? And she said, well, just, uh, you know, talk about the weather. You know, today it's hot. Uh, I think it might be raining. Uh, we had a really nice dinner. I hope uh, I hope you're feeling good. Uh, you, you know, baby, I hope you're feeling good and sleep well. And we'll talk tomorrow. Stuff like that. Okay. So when the baby was born, um, my husband walked into the in, into into the room wherever they were, and he approached me, and he sort of you know, put up his hand and he said, hi, Junior, to my newborn son. And my son just kind of looked at him and gave him this 
smile of recognition. I mean, there was just no doubt that he recognized his voice, you know. And so the postscript is interesting. And then she said, you know, the relationship that this son of mine has with my husband is so much better than my firstborn son, who did not have a chance to connect, bond with my husband while I was pregnant. So Mm -hmm. moral of the story, it really matters, you know, talking to the baby, husband and wife, or, you know, whoever uh, is the partner uh, to the unborn child is very important. I I even have stories about, let's say, dogs uh, sleeping on the pregnant woman's abdomen. I have pictures of that. It was sent to me by a lady in Italy. During her pregnancy, the dog was sleeping on her pregnant abdomen. After the birth, uh, the baby and the dog are together like you wouldn't believe it, you know, like they're the best of friends. It makes a difference. So when you're saying that mothers need to talk to their babies, and I get asked this a lot, is should they be speaking out loud or can they be speaking in their mind, in their heads? I think speaking out loud is better. Mm. I think it's better. But, you know, thinking about the baby is important. Uh, and and even think talking to the baby in your head is important. But I think talking out loud is probably better. I, I don't think there's any research to compare the two. So I cannot speak from a scientific standpoint. But from my own standpoint, I would say speaking out loud is better. OK. And do you think that babies are aware of what their mother is thinking while I they're think- pregnant? Okay, that's a, <laughs> that's a very important question. Um, I, think that, I think that babies pick up on the emotional charge in the language. So if the language is motherly, you know, if, if, if it's a caring, loving kind of communication, you know, I, I, I love you already. I so look forward to seeing you when you're born in a couple of weeks. You know, that kind of thing. They pick up on it, you know. Um, I mean, compare that to the way we talk to pets, for example, you know, to your dog or, or to your cat, whatever, you know. Uh, if you say to a dog, sit down, why don't you sit down? Not going to listen. Okay, nothing is going to happen. If you have any experience with dog, you have to speak like, sit down. Okay, they get the meaning. Okay, so I think it's the same thing with with the unborn child, you know, that uh, they pick up on the emotional valence of the language. Um, I don't know whether they can pick up on, you know, on actual words, but they get a feeling about it. Mm. So what about the feelings that women are having about, you know, that their own emotional journey in becoming pregnant, how they're, whether they have any fears or anxieties or stresses? I mean, the whole of that emotional journey for a woman. I was personally very motivated to work on my own stress and anxiety because I'd read so much around the impact of maternal stress on the unborn baby. So, you know, I'd love to sort of unpick a little bit more about, you know, whether babies do pick up on that, 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 that emotional journey that we're, the, the mother's on? Yeah, um, I think, you know, women have to realize that it's perfectly normal and natural to have anxieties. But if so, you know, don't think that you are the only person ever to have been anxious, right? That's very important to realize. Everybody is anxious. Uh, and then like women, just like everybody else, men, women, children, uh, there's a tendency to compare yourself, okay? And you think of your girlfriend who, uh, I don't know, was pregnant last year, had a wonderful birth, everything went perfectly. You compare yourself to her and you say, oh, she's so much more competent than I am, right? So you don't realize that uh, people usually put their best face forward and they don't tell you about their anxieties. And that woman that you put on a pedestal, your girlfriend, who you think is so much more competent than you are, may be more anxious than you have ever been. You just don't know it. So coming back to your question, which is a good one, um, I think that if a woman becomes sort of obsessed with her anxiety, okay, if there is 
like mounting anxiety. Uh, if every day, you know, you, you wake up early because you're anxious and you have trouble sleeping and it just starts becoming pervasive, you need to seek help. I mean, still, you know, don't be, you know, d don't be uh, fearful of, of getting help. You know, don't think less of yourself because you need help because we all need help sooner or later in life, okay? Whether it is because you have arthritis or diabetes or you need your hip replaced or whatever. I mean, we, we all need help. And there's nothing, you know, there's nothing to be ashamed of if you are anxious when you're pregnant, because like I said at the beginning, you know, it is an anxiety provoking journey. Mm -hmm. It's yes. okay. So I have a, a lot of women that listen to this show, yeah. are, they have tocophobia, which is extreme fear of birth and pregnancy. Yeah. So I'm just curious, just from, I'm thinking from a personal perspective, actually, whether yeah. there's any, you know, one one thing that I found from working with a lot of women myself with, and helping them overcome their tocophobia is a lot of women, their, the root of their tocophobia is the trauma of their own birth. Exactly. Oh, I'm so pleased to hear you say that. So talk to me more about that, because I've kind of uncovered that for myself through working with a lot of women. And, and that was the root of my own tocophobia. So I'd love to hear you talk about this a little bit yeah. more. Well, as I indicated, you know, when I discussed sort of the four major psychological factors that can mm. contribute to a good birth, you know, the fourth one that I gave you was one's own birth, mm. right? And so, um, but most women don't know about it. I mean, most people don't know about their own birth. No doctor has ever asked them about it. Although I must say that more and more doctors are beginning to ask that question now. Mm -hmm. um, and, and certainly, you know, uh, a lot of psychiatrists are beginning to ask that question. Thank God. Um, it, it has only taken about 30 years. Um, <laughs> um, but anyway, um, so... If you do have this fear that you have described, and if you do have any other um, unrealistic, what you know, like part of your brain says, this is this is silly. Like, why am I afraid of this? And the other part is afraid, right? Mm -hmm. And the two coexist very often. Um, the, the women also may have fear that the baby is, for example, sort of eating them up alive from inside, right? Mm -hmm. Or if they're going to breastfeed, you know, it, it, it will just rip into their, you know, will just rip into their breasts and destroy their nipples and things like that. So there are all kinds of unrealistic fears, but nevertheless, you know, they can be, you know, dramatic and interfere with the pregnancy. So I think the first thing is to recognize that you have it. Okay, the first thing is really, you know, tell your listeners, you know, that if you have this fear and it interferes with your life and it seems to, you know, throw a dark, long shadow over your pregnancy, get some help with that. Okay, mm. it's really, really, really important. And also indicate, because, you know, you, you have these insights, um, indicate that perhaps one, you know, there may be some causes in your very early childhood. Mm. Okay, so give them a little bit of a roadmap mm. and say, you know, it. I, I can tell you some of the reasons for that. Uh, one of them is that they had a really difficult birth. Uh, another one may be that their mother did not want them and tried to abort them. That's mm -hmm. always a possibility. Another one might be that there was a previous abortion. Um, or miscarriage, doesn't matter. And by abortion, I don't necessarily mean something illegal or whatever. It, she could have just lost the child naturally, right? So there was some loss of a, of a previous pregnancy in one way or another. Um, the mother may have given up one child for adoption, which again is a loss. Mm -hmm. And someone may have, someone very close to her may have died and uh, the unborn child may have absorbed some of that depression during her pregnancy. Right. So these, I would say, would be the most common causes of someone really being afraid to give birth. And all of them, you know, can be worked with therapeutically. Mm. And uh, a, a woman could get a great deal of relief in two or three sessions. Like this doesn't have to be a lifelong um, psychoanalysis. Yeah. 
yeah, no, that, that's the kind of speed that I'm helping these women get over their, their own tocophobia. So it can be once you've uncovered the source of that, it's very quick to let go. Very quick. Oh, yes. Now I understand, you know, and there is yeah. a lightning and, and it just lifts, you know, lifts the spirits. Yeah. And what's in, what I found very interesting is a lot of women that I've worked with who have talk, who've had tocophobia is they also tend to have a fear of medical, like medical fears that might be fear of hospitals, fear of, right. you know, um, surgical so instruments, that kind of thing. Fear of, uh, needles, all in that. Needles, injections. And to me, it just kind of screams hospital birth. Yes, <laughs> and, that's and, and, You know, just, it, and it, it reinforces the fact that it must have been their own birth that, that yes. kind of implanted all those fears in that very yes. moment for them. Yeah. Yes. Yeah? Yes, yes. No, it's lovely. It's, I'm, it's, just seeing you nod just brings me so much satisfaction. Thank Good. you. Oh, no, you're, abs <laughs> you're absolutely on the right path. Yeah. Wonderful. So let's talk a little bit more about, um, let's rewind a little bit for those women that may be planning pregnancy. So, because oh. I do have a lot of listeners that are kind of, they want to be pregnant. They, maybe they've just got married and they're, they're really planning that they're being conscious about their, their pregnancy and their birth. Uh, and thinking about what can they do now to get ready. So we've talked about the emotional work, you know, maybe reducing their levels of stress and anxiety. Yes. But let's talk a little bit about the fertility aspect and how maybe that might, you know, the emotional journey might play into that. Because I did hear you talk about this on, on another interview. Yes. Uh, well, being fit is really important. Mm. Obesity, both by, hus by husband and wife or whoever the partner may be, interferes with fertility. Uh, of course, smoking and all kinds of other drugs, you know, recreational drugs, cannabis, all of that interferes with fertility. Um, and um, I think most importantly, though, is stress, because most people, again, don't realize that when you have uh, stress hormones, uh, you also have a sympathetic over. Uh, overcharge the sympathetic system is overcharged which means that the fallopian tube which of course is incredibly incredibly small in diameter okay uh, like I don't know half a millimeter or something like that uh, that has smooth muscles around it and those are controlled by the sympathetic nervous system adrenaline and noradrenaline when your stress level goes up adrenaline is poured into the blood system and it constricts the fallopian tube. So there's no way that the sperm can get through or the ovum, okay? So the sperm and the ovum usually meet about halfway inside the fallopian tube. That's where um, they, they meet and, and start a new um, being. Um, so that's where conception takes place. So if the sperm or the ovum can't get through the fallopian tube, no conception. Mm. So that's one of the ways in which stress interferes with fertility, one of the main ways. Um, also, I think, I'm not quite sure, I haven't looked at this in a while, but I think that also the, also the fluid in, 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 in the uterus, um, which is acidic, um, may become even more acidic under stress. And um, because the sperm comes from an alkaline base, uh, the acid destroys a lot of the sperm, mm -hmm. uh, which is why, you know, uh, so many sperms are actually contained in, in an ejaculation, 300,000 sperms in one cubic centimeter of ejaculate. And so uh, the acidic environment really, you know, creates havoc for those sperm because um, they get many, many, many of thousands of them get destroyed. Mm, okay. So, um, okay. again, uh, what I'm saying is that stress increases the acidity and so even more sperm are destroyed. But I think the most important factor is the fallopian tube, that it, it, it is constricted and doesn't open. Mm. So, I mean, the, 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 the overarching thing I'm hearing is that women yeah. really do need to work on reducing their stress and work, reducing their anxiety, if, you know, to conceive, but also for the sake of baby while the baby's in utero. But also from what I understand as well, from, you know, leading up to the birth, they can be, they can be in a good place mentally and emotionally for their own birth as well. I mean, the, yes. the emotional aspect of this is 
it's, it's just so crucial. This is what you're saying. It's just a yes. really, really important part of the whole thing, isn't it? Yes, but, um, you know, when you say they have to work at it, uh, perhaps we should we should interject here something. If you work at it too much, and the emphasis is on work, mm. you get stressed. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Because you're working so hard at it that it becomes stressful. Mm. Okay. So this is, you know, when a woman in her, let's say, mid-30s, and she wants to have a child, and for the last two years she has, you know, they have tried to have a baby, and they haven't. The more time goes on that she wants to have a baby and is not successful, the more stressful the experience mm -hmm. becomes, right? And so, you know, you have women who are, you know, watching, you know, their menstrual periods and taking note of when is the best time to have sexual relations and all that and, you know, and, and calling their husband saying, today's the day, come home early. Well, it just creates more stress, mm -hmm. right? So, and how often, and this is, again, not documented by science, but God, I have, I have heard it so often uh, that when a, a woman, let's say, adopts a child, within a year she becomes pregnant, although she could not have become pregnant for five years before that, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. Why? Because she's relaxed, right? Yeah. She no longer wants to become pregnant, <laughs> so she yeah. becomes pregnant, right? So, uh, just watch the word work, okay? Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, you have to go into it. Yeah, you have to prepare for it, but not make like this all important, huge problem out of it. Okay, mm -hmm. not make it a problem. It should still be an enjoyable experience. Yeah, I because I get some women that are that send me messages saying that you know they they've heard a lot about. Um, you know how the baby does pick up on the the emotions of the mother yes. yep. and and so then they they start feeling guilty that they're not having positive thoughts all the time um and and so you know what would you say to women that are kind of worried about the, what what they are feeling and that it isn't all positive okay. and how that kind of la starts piling the guilt on for them yeah yeah well when you notice okay when a woman notices that she's not all positive not excited the way she should be reading you know parenting magazines and all that um then i think the next thing would be to ask yourself for that woman to ask your, herself why is it that she's not excited okay like what's getting in the way what is getting in the way of her really looking forward, you know? So I would imagine that she has some concerns. I don't know what they are, but even just, even if you told them to just write down in a journal, okay, on one page, what are the things that you are worried about? Mm. Just getting it out of their heads and putting it on paper is already a step in the right direction, okay? It is so much easier to deal with the page in a, in, in, in a notebook than it is in, in your head when it just kind of rambles around there, goes round and round and round like billiard balls, right? Um, so write it down, look at it, and then, you know, kind of meditate on it. Like, look at that and see, well, which of these are realistic, you know? Like, is there any reality to these, you know? Um, for example, my, my husband is going to leave me because uh, I will become uh, fat and, and ugly and unattractive, okay? Well, what is that fear based on? Has he ever told you that he would leave you, you know? Where is that coming from? Have a look at it. And if in doubt, talk to him, you know? You don't have to have it all in your head. Mm -hmm. You don't have to sort of, you know, play chess with yourself. Mm -hmm. There is a partner. If you're worried about him leaving you or, or of, you know, there, there are men who, who very, well, there are men who, who have affairs during the time that their wife is pregnant, for example. And perhaps this woman has heard about, heard about it from one of her girlfriends, you know, that while the girlfriend was pregnant, her husband was found to have an affair. Well, this induces fear in her. If we can identify that, we are already on the way to perhaps helping her visit. So let's talk a little bit about the difference between, you know, the, the bouts of like occasional feelings and emotions that might come in that aren't entirely positive 
that yes. might be flitting in and out versus those that maybe stay for a longer period of time and and you know that that kind of difference between the chronic stress or the chronic fear yeah. or the chronic anxiety versus you know if something does go wrong one week your car's packed in you got to buy a new one and you have a really stressed week but then it's all okay you know sort of there are the yeah. ups and downs of life that, that sure. kind of come, like the, the waves that roll in and off the beach and then there's yeah. the kind of the you know the, the stuff that's a little bit more long term so right. in terms of the impact of that on on the baby growing and the health of the baby that what, what are the differences that may exist between those two scenarios for example mm. Tell me the two scenarios again, please. Well, one's a little bit more chronic. So I guess whether it's a bit more long term, where maybe okay. she's staying in a, a state of stress or anxiety for sort of maybe weeks, as opposed mm -hmm. to um, she's had a really bad week. And, and then but she's come back and now she's feeling better again. You know, the, the sort of ups and downs okay. that feel a bit more right. typical. So if you have an acute stress, this is something that we have not not talked about before. And I think it's important although some women may have trouble with this because it sounds a bit irrational. But if you, for example, you had an argument with your husband, okay, and there was a lot of screaming and yelling and all that, and the pregnant woman notices that the baby is really moving around and kicking and is upset because that's how babies tell their mother that they are upset, by kicking violently and moving around a lot. So then the thing to do, in my opinion, the thing to do is talk to your baby about it. Mm. And you say to the baby, listen, Junior, um, your dad and I just had a big argument, but it wasn't about you. It's not about you. We had some difference of opinion and everything is fine. We got it worked out. There is nothing to worry about. You will have a wonderful, wonderful life once you're born. And mommy and daddy are really looking forward to welcoming you into this world. Mm. And you talk to the baby, and it really makes a difference. I don't know how, uh, <laughs> but it makes a difference. You know, I, I don't know how babies pick up on this, but 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 they do. They do. Mm. And, um, you know, uh, I, I think it, it makes a huge difference. Um, we, we, we don't really understand a lot about communication, you know, and uh, so uh, whether this is on an energetic level or some other way, I don't know, but I do know that it makes a difference. Mm. Now, I just want to go back to you mentioned how babies tell us they're not happy by yes. kicking and moving around yes. a lot. So, yes. um, yeah, so I, I just want to try and maybe get, make that help women listening just to get be super clear because you get some women saying oh my baby's really active always moving and they may be saying that in a positive way so that, is there a, a different can you tell when the baby's moving and they're not happy versus when they're just kind of juggling around and shifting around I, in inside is there what kind of differences think, should we look out for yeah i think that most mothers can uh and those that can't uh are are mothers who have sort of not really tuned in to their babies you know mm. uh, I think that if we can encourage mothers to really listen, tune in uh, to the baby, that very quickly they will recognize the difference between a baby, for example, just kicking like in a dance-like fashion, more or less like waltzing in the womb, mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, really ferociously, vigorously kicking. Um, to give you an example, I, I spoke to one woman who was uh, in a recording studio recording uh, a song with a band, and it was a rock and roll band, and we're making a lot of mu a lot of noise, and the baby really started kicking her, and kicking her fiercely, and she wanted to finish, you know, the recording session. I'm sure you can appreciate that, and um, and this is the story i mean i have i have not seen x-rays but this woman tells me that the baby kicked her so hard that he as it turned out actually broke uh the one of her lowest ribs something wow. like that. <laughs> yeah yeah and and i've heard other stories like a, another woman went to a car car race you know and um on a track around the curve, you know how, how cars kind of mm -hmm. put on the brakes and go, 
And again, the baby started kicking very, very strongly, and she left. And so nothing happened. So there are differences in the way. And sometimes the mothers, like in the first example, I can totally understand why she would, you know, want to continue. But you have to learn to listen to your baby. And this is this is a good this is a good way of doing that. Mm. And and what about the um, do you think that the coming up to the, the latest, the, the late points in the pregnancy, maybe we're yes. talking maybe 37 weeks where babies okay. start being in the, the wrong position in inverted commas and women start yes. worrying about breech babies and they turn quite a lot at that point. Yes. And um you know, do you think that by talking to the baby, you can kind of ask the baby to, you know, hey, you hey, try. cooperate here? And, and yes, is there any try. evidence or any research or anything around that, that 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 might work? I think that probably uh, midwives uh, might be able to tell you more about that because I have never actually witnessed that. But I have heard reports that it helps in some instances. It certainly can't hurt. Look at it this way, right? Um but certainly talking to the baby and asking it, you know, asking it to, to turn around and come down head first would really be, you know, very, very helpful. So please, you know, start moving. <laughs> I know. I remember when in my second birth, I, I think I coached my daughter. I said that I wanted it to be, you know, a quick birth. I, I, so I, I talked to her a lot. I said it's going to be half as long as the first one. So we're aiming for three hours. It's going to be smooth. It's going to be fast. It's going to be. And I just kept saying all this to her the whole time. And and the birth was exactly as I as I as I planned in that sense. And I, and I really do feel that she she listened. You know, and I, I I I wanted it in three hours, and she came out in two hours fifty eight. So I think she had a watch on and shot out the last minute. So I I believe that they do listen, and that does work. But that's just my story. There's, there's one thing that I might want to mention, um, which we haven't talked about, but I'm just reminded by you speaking about your own daughter, about this woman that I saw who, um, who came to see me, and she said, you know, well, she read my book, and she said, you know, when my daughter was born, she looked angry. And so I commented on that, like this is like 25 years ago, okay? I commented on this to the obstetrician and the nurses, and they all laughed because, of course, obstetricians and nurses don't believe that children can have feelings, right? Like a newborn doesn't have feelings. They think that this is, you know, a a, a totally unfeeling little blob of protoplasm. So after reading your book, you know, I was wondering, she said, whether I should talk to my daughter about this and I said yes you know definitely you know she's 13 years old now uh talk to her about it so next week the same lady comes back and she says this is what happened I spoke to my daughter and I said when you were born you looked angry were you angry and the daughter said yes I was why were you angry because you wanted a boy Wow. And this woman says, absolutely true. Like all throughout her pregnancy. She doesn't know why. She doesn't know why. It, it, it was just something that came over here. Okay. She prayed to God that she would have a son. And then when the daughter was born, she loved her, related to her. Uh, they had a good relationship. But this lady said to me, there was, it always seemed as if there was a wall between me and her, okay? Like, it, it was just not quite right. So, when the daughter told her that she wanted a boy, this woman admitted that, yes, that was true. She did, and how sorry she was that that was the case, and that she loved her daughter. And so, they started crying, they fell into each other's arms, And for the first time, this lady said she really felt close to her daughter. Mm. So children pick up on these things, you know. I don't know how, again, I say, I don't know how, uh, but strong feelings of mothers, you know, like rejection of a a certain sex, things like that, are picked up. Mm. So guard against that okay for you know for god's sake don't try to have a boy or a girl just try to have a healthy child 
Mm. And so those people, you know, there's that there's a debate of whether or not we should find out whether we're having a boy or a girl. Not and, find out. and you think not find out is that what you think? That, that's what I decided to do. Um, and oh, yeah, because it's a surprise. yeah, that that's yeah. And so because it does foster those kind of feelings, and then you start yeah. having expectations. Yes. And these expectations, I think, can be quite damaging. Um, that's right. For both parties, actually. Whereas yes. if you come from a clean slate, it can only you're making up as you go along, which I think is a much safer. I totally agree. I totally agree. Much, much safer. Much, much safer. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Be surprised, you know. <laughs> yeah. And the surprise. Yeah. No, it's absolutely. And then also people don't start buying lots of pink or blue stuff. Yeah. Which... <laughs> right. You'll have lots of time to buy pink or blue stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully neither of the pink or the blue stuff. I can't bear that stuff. But yeah, that was one of my things. I just didn't want any of that gender colour stuff yeah. in the nursery so oh, yeah. um yeah no yeah. it drives me insane okay. so um so just back to the birth experience I just wanted okay. to um talk a little bit more about the birth experience from the uh baby's perspective okay. and yes. whether or not because I've read that the you know the, the way that the baby comes out whether it's yeah. um with instrumental delivery whether it's yes. with the c-section yes. whether it's vaginal that that yes. has an impact um yes. on, well, on the book it's probably book. yeah yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that you know it has an impact on the on their on their personality on maybe the, the yes. their quirks on on yes. so just talk a little bit about that because i found that really really fascinating mm -hmm. yeah well you know your birth experience is your entry into the world so it is you know it is a huge experience you're you're going from you know intrauterine life into in, into the big world out there, you're breathing air instead of, you know, not breathing and just getting all your nutrients through the umbilical circulation. Uh, it's, 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 it's a total shift, you know. So um, this huge paradigm shift leaves a mark on your psyche, okay? It, it cannot but help to, to leave a mark behind. I mean, how could it not? Uh, it's the first experience, first big experience every one of us has, and so it's kind of a psychobiological event. And so, if you, if you, for example, are born unassisted, okay, no forceps, no drugs, just natural childbirth, totally natural childbirth, coming down the uterine canal, uh, is probably the best massage you will ever have. Because as the baby is coming down, it is being propelled forward by the muscles of the uterus. And so um, the child feels the outlines of his or her body very clearly and is born with a sense of, oh boy, I made it on my own. I'm really successful. Now, I'm not saying that this is a conscious thought, but it is somewhere you know, whatever precedes thought, that's where this is. Um, so it's, you know, like the genesis of a thought. And so um, you are born with a very positive kind of body image and a very positive sense of who you are, like you are a success, you made it on your own. Um, so this is the best possible way of being born. Um, if you are born with forceps, of course, there is pain in the neck, right? Uh, there is pain as you are being born. There is pain because the forceps hurts your neck. And so two things will happen again in terms of this, you know, the very beginnings of, of a personality trait. Uh, the first thing that will happen is that I couldn't make it on my own, the very opposite to the baby that was born naturally, okay? I needed help. And the second thing is that at times of stress, you will, you are likely to develop pain in your neck and shoulders and perhaps even in the head around the place where the forceps were put, right? Um, and also... Under stress, you might feel you are more likely to feel helpless and look for people or others to help you, which in a sense is good uh, because at least you're looking because you have a belief that other people will help you. But at the same time, you're helpless. So, you know, six of one and a half dozen of the other. Um, 
what is really, I think, the most um, difficult thing for a baby to overcome is a cesarean, is, is the C-section, okay? Um, because in the C-section, the baby doesn't go down the birth canal, okay? So there's no contact. Um, and also, it has the same feeling of I can't make it on my own. Um, so uh, there's a lack of body contact, and also there is this sense that if, I, if I'm in a tight place, if I'm in a tight place, somebody will come to my rescue, okay? And so paradoxically, a number of people who have had C-sections um, put themselves into difficult situations in life, like take really big chances, okay? Like let's say jump out of, uh, you know, parachute out of a plane, okay? Or, or in the middle of the night at two o'clock in the morning, they will, they will go uh, to pick up, I don't know, a carton of cigarettes from, from a store down the street. And obviously it's not a safe place, let's say for a, for a 20 year old good looking woman to go out at two o'clock in the morning, but she does that because she is fearless. But at the same time, she wants to know whether perhaps she will be rescued if she gets herself into a difficult position. So some of these people really play risky games in life. And the other thing is that both men and women have what, what I've called, what have I called it? Um, contact, contact hunger. Um, they, 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 they need physical contact more than your average person because they have not had that contact coming out of the birth canal. So they try to make up for it later on in life. So, you know, women like, women like that like to be hugged more than the average person, held more, hugged more. Uh, and men very often get into contact sports like football, you know, where there's a lot of, you know, smashing up against somebody else's body. This is acceptable for men. This is how they get sort of the contact that they missed out on, which is, you know, pretty strange. But, um, you know, it's one of the ways that things can go sideways. Uh, so forceps, cesarean section, natural childbirth. Uh, you, you mentioned, um, you mentioned like when you are feet first. Breach. Breach, right. Um, Breech babies, interestingly enough, and check this out with your with your ladies when you do this um, when you do this podcast. Um, breech babies are the most hard headed people of of all the other sort of modes of birth. It's sort of my way or the highway. I wonder <laughs> what matter was a breech baby. I don't know, um, but uh, they they are very very. Um, What's the word I'm looking for? Um, you know, definite about how they want things done. Mm -hmm. um, very, very obstinate. Uh, di sometimes difficult people to work with. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that they did not want to conform. Okay? In the womb, like everybody else is coming head first, but I'm not. And again, this is not a conscious thought, but it's there on some unconscious level. So uh, very often these are unconventional people and very hard nosed and my way or the highway. So, so those, are, those are some of the ways in which your birth actually can uh, put a stamp on the rest of your life. Mm. And what about being induced then? Does that have an impact? Yes, okay, good, I'm glad you asked. Yeah. One of the things, again, that most people don't realize is that actually it is the baby who initiates the birth process, okay? Uh, it is, it is in, in, the, in the baby's own body that some of the hormones um, are produced which begin the process of labor. And... Um, Many of those hormones are also in the placenta. And a lot of people think of the placenta as somehow belonging to the mother, but actually it's part of the baby's body right at the beginning when when the zygote and the blastocyst um, 
get into the posterior, take root in the posterior wall, usually of the uterus, the first thing that, de that develops is the placenta. And the placenta is from the baby's body. So the placenta produces a lot of the hormones that start labor. And so it's really the baby that sets the pace. And so if you induce labor, you interfere with the natural rhythm of that baby. That baby knows, and I'm using that in quotation marks, on some level that baby knows when he or she needs to be born. And if you induce labor or do a cesarean section before the baby is due because, and this is done in a lot of South American countries especially, like in, in Brazil, Chile, Peru, um, many of those places, um, the more well off you are, the more likely you are to go, you will have your baby in a private hospital and private hospitals have huge rates of cesarean sections, like 80, 85% of women uh, have C-sections because the doctors tell them that, you know, we, we can have it this Saturday, you know, when it's convenient uh, for you, you know, your husband will be home. Um, sounds like a good time and then Monday's a holiday so you'll have like three days in hospital and we can do it you know early in the morning we'll both be fresh etc etc so they sell them on the idea that c-section is you know like the golden the golden rule and and of course it's totally unnecessary it, it brings about complications um it, you know you have a higher rate of course of, of infections and all kinds of complications. But the worst of it is what I'm describing is that it is really not good psychologically for the baby. So uh, again, if you could tell, you know, your listeners that um, if they possibly can avoid C-section, um, natural childbirth is by far the best way. Uh, Le Boyer type of delivery, you know, with a water bath, and, um, and, and music and uh, turn down lights, uh, perhaps in a birthing room rather than in a, uh, in a surgery, in a hospital, in a surgical unit. Those are the ways to go. And then to avoid having an induction, so to allow that baby to make that choice themselves. Definitely avoid, avoid having an induction. And induction is often, often necessary because the woman is too afraid to give birth and mm -hmm. can't relax. So, uh, you know, the uterus does not relax, the cervix does not relax sufficiently, and that's when they have to do induction of labor. A lot of that has to do with fear. Mm -hmm. And a lot yeah. of it has to do with being like surrounded by apparatuses and, uh, you know, men and women in white. And it's just very intimidating, excuse me, it can be very intimidating. And how can you relax when you have about five strangers all around your bed? But also the, the pressure of induction with yes. is also very stressful for women. And I've got a friend yes. who's waiting right now for her baby to make it's an appearance. Pain. It's and, also very painful. Yeah. And and just, you know, having that pressure of being facing yes. induction is is it does kind of makes it worse, you know, and, and being able to stay calm in those days, yes. weeks after your due date is is yes quite some ask actually that's right there's nothing wrong with waiting a few days up to a week 10 days yeah. you know because yeah. uh, because everybody is different you know just because math uh, you know mathematically or statistically you know you're supposed to have 40 um 40 weeks doesn't mean that everybody is going to have 40 weeks now listen thomas it's been brilliant yes. i could talk to you all day <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> Let's but like, I'm going to have to wrap it up because we have been talking for a while yeah. and I'm just very um, you're very generous with your time and I just want to thank you so much for coming on the Fear Free Childbirth podcast is okay. there um, anything you know based on the fact that my listeners are you know planning to be pregnant or pregnant and, and maybe they do have a, a little bit of fear which is why they're drawn to listening to this show is there anything that maybe we haven't talked about that you just maybe want to say before we go um, I, I think we have we have covered everything. Um, just, just relaxing, you know. Just looking forward to the experience as an exciting part of your personal growth, you know. Uh, that that, although children can be challenging, and certainly, you know, it uh, it will bring about more work than when you didn't have children. But at the same time, you know, it's a gift, and you can learn a lot from your child. 
So it's it's a it's it's a mutually beneficial relationship. Don't look upon it as something that is just going to take from you. Okay, uh, it will it will interfere with my relationship with my husband, or you know I will have less free time. Uh, true, it may, but also it will bring a whole new way of looking at the world with it. Mm, yeah, That's what absolutely. I would say. Okay, so it's a gift. Absolutely, absolutely. I'll say that with bells on. Um, yeah, so thank you once again, Thomas. Now, if people want to find out more about your work, if maybe okay. they're not the, the fans that I am, you know, tell us about the books that you have or where they, what your web address is so that people can find out more about you and your work. Yeah, well, um, my web address is... What is my web address? Just a second. <laughs> Let me look at my web address. There we are. Okay, it is trvernymd.com lovely i'll have that link in the in yeah. the show notes for and then that, your book which is the that, secret life of the unborn child which is the one that i've devoured yeah but then there's a follow-up book which is called pre-parenting pre-parenting yeah and now i'm working on a new book on um on, on, on cellular consciousness which I cannot wait to get my hands on yes. that one because that sounds very interesting I'll call you when it's out okay well <laughs> please do another... absolutely absolutely I'll okay. be first in the queue no okay. it's been it's been lovely chatting to you Thomas thank it's you so much you. and uh, I've really enjoyed having you on thank you very much bye 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 Hello, you've just been listening to me, Alexia Leachman, on the Fear Free Childbirth Podcast. Now, this is just a wee reminder that if you're looking for more help, support and guidance on your fear-free journey to motherhood, then visit fearfreechildbirth.com, where you can find fear clearance meditations, online birth prep courses, training for birth professionals, a membership community and programmes for overcoming tocophobia. Until next time, bye for now.